All right, it's Frank DeMora. We're back again. Today is October the 9th, getting into another part of prophecy. I already gave you one YouTube video that when you go to my site, you'll see this concerning Iran, concerning Israel, Turkey, Syria, and how it's leading to the Psalm 83 war. But let me get into another prophecy now, or a few prophecies connecting the dots for you. And uh, Luke tells us in Luke 21, 25, and he says this, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity so in other words there's going to be some major problems and what is going to be the result of those problems or cause those problems the sea and the waves roaring so that's the first connection that i want to make for you so that you know what the lord had to say then in Luke 21, 11, the Lord tells us this, And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, this means in many places, and famines and pestilence, disease, and fearful sights, and great signs there shall be from heaven. So we're going to connect the dots between the famines, the, the diseases, and these fearful sights. Now, in my post of July of this year, you'll see it here, July 20th, and in the red link, you click this link and you'll be able to see it. In that warning that I gave to you earlier this year, I said this, pertaining to what was going to happen to the food. This is what I told you to look for. And this is only one of many of my warnings. I've been giving you these warnings for years, but I just pulled this one up to show you one of them. In the coming years, you are going to hear more news about how the intense heat is killing the crops. The lack of water will also take a huge toll on food prices because farmers around the world are going to see their crops shrink from one disaster after another as the weird weather takes a toll on the world's food supplies. What Jesus has warned us concerning the scriptures I posted today is only the tip of the iceberg. And so this weird weather that I was talking about and uh, showing you what how it was going to affect our food supplies, let me just show you one of the headlines. And let me go right to it right here so you can see it straight out. This is the headline. When you click to the link, you will be able to see this headline. It says, Severe food displaced 600,000 people in Nigeria's Kogai state official. Now, I'm going to go back to my site here for a second because what I did is I just outlined the most important, what I saw was the most important connecting the prophecies for you. Now, it says, Severe flooding in central North Nigeria's Kogai state has displaced 600,000 people. This is a lot of people. And when you look in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, which I don't have here right now, but in Daniel, one of the two major characteristics, knowing what the last generation would be, was one of those characteristics of people traveling back and forth. Now, I've showed you in many of my posts and my YouTube videos, people are being forced to travel and to flee. Uh, if you've been watching the news for the past five years, major storms, tornadoes, floods, earthquakes, major disasters are impacting millions and millions of people all over this world and people are being forced to evacuate to move and then after things calm down they can come back but they're going to and fro they're coming back and forth I don't believe that that prophecy just talks about people traveling on the airplane but I think it's more and more uh, encompassed when we look at what's going on and we see all of these prophecies come together at the same time, people are definitely moving and here's 600,000 of them. And of course, the scriptures do say that it's causing, it would cause massive problems, complex problems. Now, it says the camps were mostly public primary and secondary schools and some health clinics, Waya said, adding that the flood affected, look at how many communities, 457 communities across nine local government areas. That's a lot of people. It's causing massive problems, just like that prophecy said it was going to cause. Now, according to him, they what, what happened here is they set up all these camps because people were without homes, they're without education now because everything's flooded out. 
and you'll see this is what he's talking about. According to him, education, agriculture, health, and roads are some of the sectors already identified they have been badly affected, some of those complex problems. He said the government had the interim decided to merge 87 public primary and secondary schools currently being used as the resettlement camps with nearby government schools. Now, Wall expressed regrets that the communities ravaged by the flood were, guess what? The food basket of the state. The state. Now, this is definitely going to cause massive problems. It not only is going to cause hunger problems, but it's going to generate problems with the food prices because they just wiped out the majority of the food in the food basket area, the growing area in the state saying that the situation constituted the threat of food security and health of the people, obviously. Uh, he said the government was thinking of how it could assist farmers in the remaining 12 local government areas not affected by the flood to extend their farmlands using mechanized farming techniques. In other words, they had a massive area that was uh, flooded out, which they can't use anymore. So now what they're going to try to do is incorporate these 12 areas right here uh, to try to establish uh, more crops. And it's just, you know, they're looking up, they're looking up hill, it's trying to get food into these people. So it says at least 18 of the country's 38 states have been affected by floods caused by torrential downpours in recent weeks and concern is growing about the spread of airborne disease such as cholera. So not only does we see that the floods moving people back and forth to and fro like Daniel tells us, not only are we seeing massive problems, complex problems like Luke 21, 25 tells us, but also Luke 21, 11 shows us now they're concerned about disease. So. I'm hoping that you can see how all of these things are tied in because all of these things are part of the prophecies that the Lord told us to keep on the watch for. And of course, you're going to see food prices continually decline. I've been warning about this for five years, over five years now, uh, to watch the news because the food prices will go up and you're going to see this continue to take place. Now, moving on to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. And I'm going to give you three scriptures in this Second Timothy and Thessalonians that I'm going to connect the dots for you. I know that you're going to find this interesting, uh, especially if you're not reading the Bible like you're supposed to be and you just turned into my YouTube channel. In Hebrew 10.25, there is a warning. And listen to this warning. Please take this to heart. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. That manner of some is but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see that day approaching. So in other words, what the Lord is telling us here, that people are leaving the church. Instead of coming together, they're leaving the church. They're abandoning the church. And what we see in Hebrews is say, look it, don't do this, especially as you see that day approaching. Now, what is he talking about? What day is he approaching? Well, obviously it's the approaching of number one, the Antichrist system, and number two and foremost, the return of Jesus Christ for his church. And we all know what that is. It's the rapture of the church. So don't be disheartened. The Lord is showing us, don't be disheartened. Assemble yourselves. Come together because you're going to draw strength from one another. And this is what the Lord told us to do. Watch it. This is good advice. Now in 2 Timothy 4, 3, what happens in the last days, especially when you... Uh, move away from a church and you stop reading the Word of God. Listen to what he says. For the time will come when they shall not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. So we know that you're going to be more acceptable to false doctrine. If you're not reading, if you're not studying, if you're not abiding in Christ, you're going to be on the battlefield alone against Satan and all his enemies, and they are going to bombard you and bring you down. This is one of the reasons why the army of God, his children, need to be assembled together to gather strength for the wars that they're fighting against the devil. 
Now, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 3, it says, let, let this, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. What day? Well, obviously, the day that the Antichrist is going to show up, except, and, and the rapture of the church, as I just said a, a few minutes, minutes ago, for that day shall not come except there be in a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. So what do we have here? Well, we have several warnings. What's good for the church? Keep assembling yourselves. Be in fellowship. Praying. Gathering st strength from one another. Keeping on the watch. Staying in sound doctrine. And do not be deceived and keep on the watch. Most important, all right? So now I want to give you a little bit of insight on what's taking place. Because there's a new study out. It says one-third of the adults under 30 have no religious affiliation. Let me go right to this article. There you go. Let me pull it up for you so you can read it here. It's, and this came from the CBC Washington, or CBS from Washington. One-fifth of American adults have no religious affiliation, and that number is increasing rapidly. Now, why is, you know, when you look at the Word of God and you know Mark 13, 8, you know that these last day signs are like the birth pangs of a woman. Don't be surprised that it's increasing because we're on the road to fulfill every one of those prophecies that haven't been fulfilled yet. Now, the number of Americans who do not identify with any religion continues to grow at a fast pace. And one-fifth of the U.S. public and one-third of the adults under 30 are religious, unaffiliated today, the highest percentage ever in the Pew Research Center polling. In the last five years alone, unaffiliated have increased from just over 15% to just under 20%. 20% of all U.S. adults, and their ranks now include more than 13 million self-described atheists and, and uh, agnostics, and nearly 6% of the U.S. public, as well as nearly 33 million people who say they have no particular religious affiliation, 14%. says so this large and growing group of American is less religious than the public at large on many con uh, conventional measures, including the frequency of attendance at religious services and the degree of importance they attach to religion in their lives. In other words, what's happening here is what we see from the days of Noah where the Lord tells us in Matthew chapter 24 that in the last days we would see the same thing happen. The people would become like the people in Noah's day where God was tossed out of the arena and they did what they want and they were sinning like crazy. And now this generation has gone the same way, the exact same way. Now let me go back here and show you that there are uh, churches and there are in our in our communities across America now in people's lives across America not only are people becoming less involved with religious affairs but they the Christians are also leaving the church so when the Paul warned that in the last days there would be a falling away of the faith falling away first we're seeing that road being paved right now and people are walking on that road and what that tells us is the Antichrist is coming and he's not that far off. Now one of the things that I want to show you, I just took to Google and I just outlined three of the things that shows you some research about people leaving the church and why they're leaving the church. Now I'm going to bring you to the first one here because there's six reasons here that they outlined. You'll see at the top here, six reasons young Christians leave church. And I'll just read, I'll let you go and read the entire article, but I'm just going to read you the reasons. Churches seem overprotective. 
Now keep in mind, most of the kids, when you were when we're dealing with this, you'll see that the ages, 18 to 29 years old, is a Christian demonize everything outside the church. Now we're dealing a lot of these results are coming from the young people. But, but, but I'm finding out from personal experience talking to the young people, they don't even know the Word of God. And so they're not studying the Word of God. I've asked. And the majority of the people that I talk to don't know anything that I'm asking about the Scriptures, and it's obvious that they have never read the Scriptures. And a lot of people even tell me, and I didn't participate, obviously, in this, this poll, but they tell me they don't really care. And this is the attitude that the Antichrist loves. It's the attitude that Satan wants people to have. And again, it's signs that we are, we're in the last days. So churches seem overprotective. In a church, one of the main functions of the church is to protect your soul, to help you protect your soul, to help you get into the Word of God where you'll have the strength of God knowing where you can stand on his word to protect not only your physical body in, through prayer and belief in the Lord Jesus Christ, but your soul who is going to spend eternity with God or without God. So there really isn't much of a, a case to be leaving the church when the church is doing what is good for the person. And of course, people are going to do their own things. They don't like it. They're going to do their own things. And this is what the Lord told us that they would be doing. Here's the second reason. Teens and 20s something experience of Christianity is shallow. I'll just read this a little bit. It says, The second reason that young people depart church as young adults is that something is lacking in their experience of church. One third said church is boring. Well, look at the Antichrist wants you to believe this. Satan wants you to believe this. And he is making something of your life and he's twisting it and he's, he's accomplishing the goal of making people think that their, their life here is based on how much uh, glorification they can get from a personal experience. And if they don't get this, then it's boring. This is a text by Satan on your kids, on your husbands, on your wives, or anyone else who gives excuses that I don't want to go to church because it's boring. Now, how are you going to feel when you ask Jesus Christ where you're going to spend eternity when you stand before him and you said, Lord, I didn't want to go to church because it was boring. When the Lord says, don't forsake the gathering of the saints, especially as you see that day approaching, and this is why, people, is because Satan is doing what he can to convince people that a religious experience has to be impacted by activities or make me feel special or, or give me something. When you're supposed to be worshiping the Lord and giving Him something, not yourself. But our society has turned selfish. We, I, me, even have tons of magazines of self. And that's where we are. Reason number three, churches came across as antagonistic to science. Well, there's always going to be a conflict because science... Many of the scientists are trying to prove that there's no existence of God and they're running to deadheads and dead ends constantly. But every time that science, on the other side, the believers who were the scientists are coming out showing that Jesus in the Bible is correct by whether it be artifacts or scientific discoveries, they shun this. It's just another one of those excuses. That's all it is. It's an excuse. Now, reason number four, young, young Christians, church experiences related to sexuality are often simplistic and judgmental. Well, look at the Lord wants good for you. And if the Lord shows you that if you engage in practices like they did in Sodom and Gomorrah and in the, the days 
that I'm referring to are the days of Lot's generation and Noah's generation, what are the outcomes? Syphilis, gonorrhea, disease, death, all of these things are which do not come from the Lord, but they're a byproduct of sin. So if you want a healthy life, then you abide by the precepts in the Bible, but people don't want to do that anymore. They want to do their own thing. They want another excuse, and they want to participate in sex, and so there's an, another excuse. Number five, here we go. They wrestle with the exclusive nature of Christianity. Well, obviously, in John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me. And unless you encompass this, and unless you embrace the words of our Messiah, then you will be facing judgment from Jesus Christ, not from Christians. Christians' job are not to, to judge anybody. We're not to judge anybody. We don't know the hearts and the minds of men and women like God knows the hearts and the minds of men and women. And we know that it says in the scriptures that only Jesus knows what's in your heart what's in your mind so you're not going to make excuses that are going to stand when you meet Jesus Christ and I, I'm praying that you understand this what you're seeing here is Antichrist philosophy that's what this is generated by the works of Satan himself and here's another reason number six the church feels unfriendly to those who doubt now let me say this. I'm sure that there's a lot of churches that can do a better job to show people that they're loved. And I, and I would be one of the first people to say I've been through many, many churches where I walked into the church and I felt like nobody cared. So this is generally a problem. But it's not an excuse to not fellowship for Jesus Christ. Not for a church or not for the pastor, but you come together as a body of believers for Jesus Christ. You lost your perspective on worship. You don't go together to worship each other or the pastor. You're going to worship Jesus Christ. Now, going back, let me go back here for a second and let's revisit here. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves. And now we already saw that thousands and thousands of people are doing that. They're fulfilling scripture. We see that they are not going to endure sound doctrine. We see that in one of the excuses. The exclusive, the exclusive uh, statement by Jesus that you're not going to heaven unless you go through Jesus Christ. And so again, it's another attack by Satan and a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. And then again, let no man deceive you by any means. So we know that people are being deceived. And also that that day shall not come except the falling away first. And now you know that the church, people are leaving the church. They're coming up with these lame excuses. They're believing Satan's propaganda and the church is falling away. But let me tell you something. For those of us who believe in Jesus Christ, for those of us who take the stand like the early church, we don't care what everybody else does. We take a stand on Jesus Christ. We decided in our lives that we would be on fire for the Lord Jesus Christ. We would not be lukewarm so that the Lord would spit us out of his mouth as it says in the book of Revelation. But we in the church, the real church, the real people who love Jesus Christ and know they won't make an excuse of why they can't attend the assembly. We, uh, we accept the word of the Lord Jesus Christ. We come together because we know that Jesus will meet us there. He will give us the strength to combat exactly what you've been seeing in this post today. All of these excuses, all of this is all Antichrist movement, and it's all backed by Satan himself. So please, people, look at what is important. Look, where are your priorities? You have fallen from the faith because Satan has allowed you to be dragged down primarily because, first of all, you stop reading the word and you stopped having God, the Lord Jesus Christ, guide you in this world on his word found in scripture. 
And all I can say is this, I love you no matter what, but someday you will stand before the Lord Jesus Christ and I don't want you to stand before the Lord without the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ covering you. And if you're leaving and if you're going into the world, notice what the Lord tells us. Stay out of the world. He tells us don't be part of the world. And when you do the things that you're doing and you see in these studies, you've inundated your life with the world and it's not good news. Here's the good news. Jesus wants to forgive you. Jesus wants you back. He doesn't want to lose anyone. All you have to do is come home. Tell the Lord you, you've made a mistake. You've seen it. The, the, the blinders are off your eyes and you want to come back to Christ. And he will take you back. And that's one of the reasons why he gave us the story about the prodigal son who came back. And he ran down the street. He ran down the way to see him and give his son a hug and to welcome home. Jesus is waiting for you today. No excuses are any good for the Messiah who hung on the cross for you. Run to him today. He's waiting. God bless. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Today is October the 9th, 2012. And again, this is Frank DeMore bringing you connections between Bible prophecy and current events. So without any delay, let's go right into it. Now we're going to, since we know that the Psalm 83 war is advancing towards us really, really quickly, we could see this in the news, and how this Psalm 83 war is going to affect the nation Israel, I, I always start with what's happening with Israel because God has chosen this tiny nation to sanctify his name through this nation. So it's really important to see what the Lord has shown us about the nation of Israel and outlining nations around Israel, what's going to happen to the people who come against the nation of Israel. And of course, if you're new, Psalm 83, that war gives us details of who's going to attack Israel in the last days. And bear with me if you've been with me for some time, but for the new people, uh, 1 to 10, you'll see all the names in the Old Testament of who is going to attack Israel in the last days. And then on the right-hand side, you'll see the modern-day uh, people, where they live. For example, the Gaza Strip. We know that this is the Old Testament uh, Philistina, which is the modern-day of Philistines, if you will, or the Palestinians. And, of course, we're going to be covering some news today about Assyria in the Old Testament, which is modern-day Syria. And, uh, of course, this involves, if we wanted to go back to the Old Testament to see who those people were, they would also involve northern Iraq. So keep those in mind when we go through these articles because you're going to see how it's tied in together. And uh, when we're when dealing with prophecy, of course, we have to give you the scriptures that show us that these prophecies are coming to pass. And Zechariah 12.3 is one of those prophecies that are going to stick around with us until the church is raptured and the, the Lord comes back. So we need to see what that has to say. And if you're new, uh, this is going to be interesting uh, to you. I, I, I'm well aware of that. <laughs> so what does it say? Zechariah 12, 3, and in that day I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. Now most of the people have been with me. They've seen all the documents that I put up, all the reports showing us that Jerusalem has already come and it is a burdensome stone for all the nations. The peace policies, the uh, the uh, constant conflicts of what's going on in the Middle East over this holy city of Jerusalem is always in a new someplace every single day around the world somewhere so we know that Jerusalem has already become a burdensome stone and as of late it's definitely become a burdensome stone for the major powers like the United States and uh, the European Union Russia and so forth and all of these things all of these nations uh, are listed in in scripture that uh, points to fulfillment of Bible prophecy except for the United States where we only see them in Ezekiel chapter 38 but they don't do anything to help Israel but that's another prophecy 
So let me just say that we know that as the scripture says, they will burden some stone for all people and all that, that burden themselves with it shall be cut into pieces. This is a warning from the Lord saying, don't mess with my people or this is what's going to happen to you. Now it says, though all the people of the earth are gathered together against it. In other words, before it's all over, the bottom line is uh, everyone, every nation will be coming against Israel. Israel will be left alone. They will have no allies. And if you saw my post yesterday, I even showed you another example. There was a congressman uh, who went to Israel and uh, he gave a speech and he was essentially saying that don't count on the United States for any help. And this is again essentially what we see in the book of Ezekiel when that war takes place. So let's go to the news to see what's going on because for years now I've been warning you that the rockets are not going to stop being launched from the Gaza, being launched from uh, satellite peoples like the Hamas, the Fatah, and the Hezbollah who are enemies of Israel because they're trying to uh, create war. They're trying to create havoc to take Israel out. So let's go to the first article and see what that says. As you can see, there's the missile that is being fired. And I told you over and over again, just based on what I know from the scriptures, that don't think that these missiles are going to stop because they're only going to escalate because the Lord told us that these last days events would happen as a a woman with birth pangs and we know that the uh, the birth pangs are getting more intense but this says the rocket fired from the northern Gaza Strip landed in Eshkol region early Tuesday morning no damage or injuries were reported now the incident becomes after dozens of rockets and mortars were launched into Israel on Monday and most of which fell into open areas causing no damage although one rocket also fell into the Esco region and hit the petting zoo and caused the death of several animals. Now the Hamas which is again as I showed you in my uh, in the beginning of this video that the Hamas is named as one of the peoples who will be coming against Israel and that's Psalm 83 war so every time that we read about the Hamas it shouldn't come to a surprise to you because it was already written. Now Hamas claimed responsibility for Monday's attacks which said that were in retaliation for Sunday IAF airstrike. And if you're new, if you haven't been covering the news, this is the Israeli Air Force. That's what these abbreviations means. So the Israeli Air Force airstrike which killed one operative and wounded another along with several civilians. Now the IDF, the Israeli Defense Force, claimed the men were senior Hamas operatives planning an attack and are always planning attacks. Now Gaza-based terrorists have fired over 500 rockets and mortars at nearby Israeli towns and kibbutz since the beginning of 2012. So when you go back and to my post, you can do a Google search if you want. Frank, the more of Israel or the Hamas and the Palestinians will not stop uh, sending rockets and mortars in. Just check how many times I've warned you, and you see this is the product. Now, we've had 500 of these things since 2012. And what happens? Well, obviously, just like what the news says, the Israeli Air Force, when they are hit, they have. Uh, a policy that they go back and they retaliate and they go after the people in the Gaza who were sending off these missiles. Israel was one of the best in the world to go and take out their enemies and so this is what they're doing. Now what's causing uh, a major concern here is because when these things escalate we know that the outcome will be war and we know what war it is because the Lord already told us what that war was. So this kind of news uh, is really important when you're studying and when you're looking for the signs that the Lord told us to look for. It wasn't, hey guys, if you got time, why don't you just keep on the watch? That's not what the Lord said. He said, keep on the watch. It was a command by our, our Lord. And the reason why he commanded this is because he knew that if you were watching, you are going to see those things that are coming to pass 
and you would be uplifted knowing that God's word has, has legs to stand on the solid rock, all right? And you would know that these things were not just by a coincidence, but they were something that the Lord said was going to happen. So now let's take this headline, the second headline that you hear, see here. And if you just found my YouTube channel, when you go to my website, the BibleProphecyMan.com, you'll see the link. You could just click the link and uh, read the entire article if you'd like to do that. But let me go to that link right now, and you'll see the news that I pulled up here. And uh, it says, Russ and Johnny, Israel needs U.S. permission to hit Iran. Let me just scroll right down because there's no reading, no use reading the same thing twice. But it says, Israel requires the permission of the United States if it wants to carry out a strike in Iran. Former Iranian President Akbar Hassan Rasanjani said Monday, according to the Iranian media, Israel cannot attack Iran on its own, Rasanjani said. And according to Iran's semi official uh, Mara News Agency, if it attacks Iran, it must be sure that the United States will join it, either at the beginning of the war or during the war. Therefore, it needs the United States permission. Now, relations between Jerusalem and Washington have been strained recently amidst mounting pressure by the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to set clear red lines on the Iranian nuclear program. And U.S. President Barack Obama has refused to do so. And what else is new? Instead of opting for a strategy of implementing robust sanctions against Iran aimed at slowing oil exports and devaluing the rail. Now I have to admit that the rail is devaluing and people are getting out uh, of the rail and are going towards gold in other currencies like I posted a few days ago. Now it says the Ross and Johnny examine or emphasize that the enemies have pinned their hopes against Iran on sanctions which have slashed Iran's oil export earnings and have caused the rail to lose one third or one to two thirds of its value in just 10 days. And he said that this shows the West isn't serious about military threat, but added we should prepare ourselves for any eventuality. Now, what is really important here, we know from Zechariah 12, 3, that all the, all the what? All the people of the earth will be coming against Israel. And Israel and the United States have been friends for a very, very long time. But under this man, that is changing. And it even mentions it here, strained recently amid the mounting pressures because President Barack Hussein Obama will not go and give a, uh, a direct response to we will help you militarily in Israel if you attack Israel or Iran's nuclear facilities. Now, it, the time clock is ticking and Iran knows that and they're just sitting back waiting for Iran to hit them. This is exactly what Iran wants. Now, why does Iran want this? Well, this is going to even isolate Israel even more in the world if Israel attacks Iran, why these sanctions are going on. But Israel knows that as the time clicks, Iran is getting much closer to this nuclear bomb that Ahmadinejad, this isn't a picture of Ahmadinejad, but Ahmadinejad has said that he was going to use this against Israel to try to kill him. I mean, wipe him off. So we have several things that are going on here of importance, but the, the most, I think that the most important part is this man for the first time, uh, he is a man who's demonstrating his alliance is with the Muslims and not with Israel. And if you want more information about that, just take a look at my video that I made yesterday. You can go to my site and see this. And uh, it, you'll see uh, the fruits of the president, what he's doing. So going back now again to my website, let's take a look at this next article. And uh, But be before I get there, I want to connect why it's so important, why I'm going to this article. And this has to do with 
Syria, and Damascus, and what the prophet said. So Isaiah chapter 17, 1, the burden of Damascus, behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be in ruinous heap. Now, what does that tell you? Damascus is destined to be destroyed. Now, how is it going to be destroyed? Do we have any uh, knowledge? Do we have any insight of what's going to happen? We'll take a look at this. Also, Jeremiah chapter 49, verse 23 to 27, concerning Damascus. Hemeth is founded in Ar uh, Arpad, for they have heard evil tidings, and they are faint-hearted. There is sorrow on the sea. It cannot be quiet. Damascus, here we go again, you, just as Damascus was mentioned in Isaiah, and now it's in the uh, Jeremiah prophecy. Damascus is waxed feeble, and turneth herself to flee, and fear has seized on her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her as a woman in travail. This is almost essentially the same thing the Lord warns us in Mark 13, 8 about this these birth pangs, and as we see in Thessalonians where Paul mentioned the woman with uh, travailed with child. So uh, we have three different places where we see that the events will happen as a woman who's carrying a child or in labor pain. And it, it, the intensity is getting much, much worse if you're following the news. Now it says, how is the city of praise not left? The city of my joy. Therefore, her young men shall fall in the streets. They're already falling in the streets. And all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will kindle a fire on the wall of Damascus. Will this be a nuclear explosion? Well, it doesn't really tell us in the scriptures. It doesn't say nuclear explosion. Obviously, the prophet back then or even Isaiah. They didn't understand what a nuclear bomb was. Not like we do today. So when they're talking about fire, it could be the fire of some napalm, it could be a fire of nuclear detonation, limited nuclear detonation, or it could just be that, that this fire will come out of the sky from God and uh, wreak havoc on Damascus. But we do know that the outcome will, will be what? It shall be consumed, the palaces of ben, ben Hedadad. So we know that Damascus uh, in the near future is going to be taken out. Syria is in major trouble coming up. And if you're a Christian, keep your eyes on the news, especially if you live in this area, because you're, need, you're going to need to get out before this fire comes down on Syria and Damascus. And so when you see the news, when you... News like this that I'm going to report now is very important. Britain sending troops to Syria to join the rebel war on Damascus. Let's go to that one. All right, and here it is. You see that this is uh, today's today's date because uh, or today's the ninth, excuse me, and uh, this is current news. And it says this: a former. H.S. C.B. Bank Clerk is among as many as 50 British men fighting in Syria alongside the rebels and the terrorist groups. And the men, predominantly of South Asia and North African backgrounds, are understood to have joined the Syrian terrorist groups since the battle began, began last year, according to the security sources. And the, the bank clerk from the... Uh, Brighamham is understood to have traveled to Syria earlier this year, about 12 months after leaving his job at the HSCB, the Sunday Times reported. In addition to the former bank worker, a man in his early 30s of Pakistani origin, the Britons are understood to include an eight or NHS doctor. In June, Daily Start reported that the British defense chiefs had drawn up secret plans to start covert military operations in Syria. And the report said that the SAS troops and M16 agents were the Syria ready to help arm rebels and terrorist groups of civil war break if the civil war breaks out. And it already has broken out. That's obvious if you take a look at the news. 
breaks out as expected this weekend so it's really getting more intense there they also had high-tech satellite computers and radios that could instantly send back photos and details of Assad's forces as the situation develops now white wall sources said that it was vital that they could see what was happening on the ground for themselves and if civil war breaks out the crack troops are on hand to help with fighting said the insider the report said now the British Foreign Secretary William Hague has refused to rule out using military action against the Syrian government and the Syrian Whitehall source that the British forces were due to create safe havens for the rebels in Syria admitting a safe haven safe havens operation would be an invasion of Syria now why is this all of this so important well number one the birth pangs in Syria getting worse. Number two, now you're going to have outside troops coming in from Britain. And this is going to be uh, pointing to what Bashar al-Assad said previous this year. He said that if he saw outside forces coming in that and he was going to lose control, that he was going to attack Israel. And what does that mean? Well, it points again, Syria in mention in Psalm 83. Syria at that time, when you go back to my site and you take again look at this, is it possible because of the troops that are coming in? Is it possible that the civil war that's breaking out and getting much worse is leading to the Psalm or the uh, the Psalm War and the fulfillment of Isaiah 17:1 and Jeremiah 49? I believe that it is, and I believe that you're going to see more problems than I'm already seeing more problems come into play as I read the news and you, I think that you're going to understand this as well. Now the next article that I want to bring you to it says Turkey president said worst case unfolding in Syria. Now please understand this Syria is mentioned in the Psalm 83 war all right there isn't any mention of Turkey in this war because Turkey's not involved in this war. But what if Turkey is involved in eliminating Syria? Right? Or doing damage to Syria that enables part of the Syrian forces to join up with the rest of these nations that are mentioned in this psalm and attack Israel. And you'll see why I'm saying that in a second. So let's go down to this, uh, the Turkish news report, and you'll see why this is important. Oops, excuse me, I got the uh, one, there you go. Now, according to this news article, it says Russia may finally have to respond to the crisis in Syria. Now, very interesting because Russia is mentioned as the main nation who will lead the attack on Israel in Ezekiel 38, of which Syria is not going to be a participant in that war. So something happened to take Syria out because Syria is, uh, they are uh, really strong allies with Russia. And you see this is Vladimir Putin right here. So let's see what it says. Last week, we talked to Ross Wilson, the U.S. ambassador to Turkey from 2005 to 2008, who had told us that there needs to be a stronger response from NATO as the chaos in Syria increasingly threats regional peace and stability. Here's the war in the rumors of war that Jesus was talking about, because that's what they're talking about in this article. In many other articles, they're telling us the situation in Syria is going to cause a regional war, and I know what what war that will be. And again, we know that from the scripture it will be the Psalm 83. Wilson noted that the world leaders have been wise to resist direct military intervention in Syria, but said that individual NATO members need to make clear that Turkey's security is an alliance concern and prepare for a situation in which operation on edges of Syria or along its borders becomes necessary. So what does this tell us? It looks like Turkey may have a confrontation with its uh, former friend, 
uh, Syria. Now, Turkey is mentioned in the uh, or the Ezekiel War with Putin. So it only stands to reason that if Turkey gets involved and they, they start taking out Syria, that's why Syria is not mentioned in the Psalm 83 war because it would be because this man, Bashar al-Assad, is a ally of, of uh, Russia. Let me go on. It says that puts Russia in which has been, which been telling NATO to stay away from Syria in its tricky spot because obviously it's a very tricky spot because he's aligned with Bashar al-Assad, Russia is. Leaked. The Syrian intelligence revealed that the top Russian general killed by opposition forces while advising Assad and that in June Russia ordered Syria to stop to shoot down the, uh, the Turkish jet. And we asked Wilson, who served as the U.S. Gen the uh, Council General to the American Embassy in Moscow, USSR, from 1980 to 1982, as well as from 1987 to 1990, about the Russian element of the Syria conflict. Now, although he didn't really have much to say about the report, Major General Vedermos Kozov's death, he did offer some insight on what can be done in regards to Russia. Russia and the Soviet Union, before it have long and close association with Assad, and Wilson told us, in an international affairs, you don't, you don't necessarily break with your friends lightly. And Wilson said that although Russia uh, diplomat, diplomats make current observations about the conflict, the risks of intervention, the extremely uh, complicated nature of serious society, the possibility of setting off even more problems than you were getting, that you were trying to fix. And obviously, I believe that the more problems that they're talking about is that uh, once Syria saw that he was losing his power, Bashar al-Assad, that he would attack Israel exactly like he warned it we do. So we're just, this really shows us we're one step to that actually taking place. Now finishing this out here, says they are making them uh, from a uh, perspective that ignores where Syria is clearly headed. And where are they clearly headed? Violence, more violence, more war, more destruction. So Turkey has also had strong ties with Syria until relatively recently, just like I said. Now, Wilson noted, explaining that their relationship only began to deteriorate last spring and summer in the context of the rising violence and the rising suppression of the Syrian people after they felt that Assad gave them false assurances about steps that he would take to end the violence. So there's a connection between Russia, there's a connection between Syria and Iran, or Turkey here, that and all of these nations are listed in either the Psalm prophecy or they are mentioned in the Ezekiel chapter 38 prophecy. So let me show you here another, where, since we're talking about Turkey, and uh, Turkey, as you see from this article, Turkey president says worst case scenario unfolding in Syria. So it says the Turkish president, Abdul Gol, said that Monday that the worst case scenarios were now playing out in Syria and Turkey would do everything necessary to protect itself as its army fired back for the sixth day after a shell from the Syria flew over the border. So Gol said that the violence in Turkey's southern neighbor were the result against the President Bashar al-Assad to involved in a civil war that threatens to draw in regional powers uh, could not go indefinitely or go on indefinitely and Assad's fall was inevitable. So if Turkey is saying this and, and they're having problems with Syria right now and even Turkey is claiming now that the uh, Assad's government can't go on. That just, again, as I said before, tells us that the dog, if you will, 
the Syrian leader who's killing his own people is being pressed against the wall and he's going to have to do something drastic and I believe that something drastic will be he will make a move on Israel and when that happens there you go we're gonna see the Psalm 83 war now the worst case scenarios are taking place right now in Syria our government is in constant uh, consultation with the Turkish military whatever is needed is being done immediately as you see and it will continue to be done Gaul said and there will be a change a change uh, a transition sooner or later it is a matter for the international community to take effective action before it, before the Syria turns into a bigger wreck and further blood is shed that is our main wish he told the reporters in Ankara which is the capital of Turkey so there's a lot going on but there is a lot of information that the Lord gives to us in these prophecies and so what is going on is again heading towards to the fulfillment of two major wars that haven't been fulfilled yet the Psalm 83 war and then the Ezekiel 38 and 39 chapters 38 and 39 that war so now breaking off now to another segment because when we're dealing with the scripture here of all the nations coming against Israel uh, when you come against Israel bad things happen to you and the Lord even tells you I'm gonna cut you into pieces so if you want something really bad to happen to your nation try messing with Israel and you'll see what's going to happen to your your countries now the nations here God is going to be dealing with these countries guess what he says it right here will be cut into pieces now they're burdening themselves all of these countries are burdening themselves over what over Jerusalem and we know that God will be dealing with these nations and they will be defeated and this part of the prophecy will be fulfilled but we also know that anybody who comes against Israel will be cut into pieces and we know that the United States based under Barack Hussein Obama is coming against Israel how do we know that well let me give you one example here's an example of the US con congratulates Venezuela election let me go to the article Uh, and this came out yesterday. It says, Yesterday, Venezuelan strongman Hugo Chavez won election, and today the White House is congra congratulating Venezuela on that outcome. And from the Pool Report, which details a gaggle held by the White House spokesman Jay Carney, Carney said that the U.S. congratulates Venezuelan people on its election while noting that the U.S. has its difference with Chavez. And President Obama is on his way to tour Cesar E. Chavez National Monument in California. So here we go. We have the president who's congratulating these people, this leader. But let me show you something. Who this man, Chavez, is in uh, bed with. Then you're going to understand why this becomes so important. And here you go. This was earlier this year, February 7, 2012, and I highlighted this headline for you. The Latin America, America, Iran's new front against the U.S. And this is the man that Barack Hussein Obama is congra congratulating and going to see this monument. And here is Ahmadinejad from Iran who is saying he is going to wipe out the nation of Israel. This man will be in part participating in the Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39 war. And we have these two guys in bed with each other, both saying that they want to wipe out the nation of Israel. And you have an American president and the administration congratulating a man who wants to destroy the nation of Israel. Now, do you see the connection? now do you see who's under the curse not only is he the Venezuelan government under the curse and Ahmadinejad under the curse but anybody 
that aligns themselves with him are under the curse and all of those nations in Ezekiel chapter 38 are under the curse and anybody who goes along with them and does not support Israel including the United States will be cut to pieces this is what the Lord tells us so if you want you want a government if you want a people to be blessed you better be voting for somebody who is not going to con con dread con excuse me congratulate somebody who is in bed with the people that want to destroy Israel now according to that it says appearing before an Orthodox Union presidential forum in uh, Boca Raton Florida synagogue on Monday January 30th 2012 former the senator Rick Santorium stated that when President Ahmadinejad recently toured the capital of Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, and Ecuador, it was not on a form of cultural diplomacy. It was primarily to increase the tempo of preparations for the war against America. And you have the President of the United States congra congratulating this guy. Are you kidding me or what? He then added, it is long past time for us to respond, but instead our president declares eminent victory. And while Ahmadinejad is the visible figurehead representing the Iranian regime, it is Hezbollah, which is named in the Psalm 83 war, Iran's terrorist subcontractor, which is creating cells throughout Latin America and inside the U.S. as well. And shortly after the Second Lebanon War, which is also mentioned, Lebanon is mentioned in that Psalm 83, the Lebanon War between Israel and Hezbollah, which is mentioned in the Psalm 83, the U.S. Foreign House or the U.S. House Foreign Affairs Committee held hearings on the global reach of the Hezbollah cells. The committee heard testimony regarding the capabilities of Hezbollah to attack the U.S. and other Western targets. <laughs> what other Western targets? Obviously, they're talking about Israel as well. The protocol for the hearing clearly established Hezbollah's wide reaches under the military leadership of Amman Mogahab, who was was assassinated in February 2008 in Damascus, Syria. And so there you have the connection there, a very strong connection, and obviously these connections are, uh, are in relation to fulfillment of prophecies that will happen shortly. So there you go. Keep, keep your eyes on the news. I'm going to do the best I can to bring you this news connecting the dots and tell other people what I'm doing here in hopes that if they don't know the Lord they'll be encouraged to want to know more to check the news to keep on the watch and hopefully the major goal is have their souls ready for the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and the only way that they can have that is by asking Christ to be their Savior thank you